Hey guys, I'm Ruben Lara, and today I'll be having a flatting face-off against myself using two popular methods of flatting to once and for all prove that good traditional flatting is worth the time it takes, and that actually in the long run it's not much slower than so many supposed shortcuts that are floating around out there. My goal is for you to stop looking for a faster way to flat and just use that time to get actual work done using sound flatting methods. Now in my experience, if you rush and cut corners, you will achieve some kind of result, but it will be sloppy and may actually hinder a larger production workflow if you're preparing work for someone else. Now I'll be mainly working in Clip Studio Paint, but uh, this video applies to both Clip Studio and Photoshop. All right, let's dive in. Okay, so first off, I wanna demo the two methods I'll be pitting against each other. And that's the fill bucket, which I'll be doing on the left, and creating shapes manually, which I'll be doing on the right. Now here's the original piece of art from Guardians of the Galaxy issue number three. I didn't draw or color this art, it's colored by Richard Eisenhove. I just extracted, extracted the line work for the purpose of this demo. So I'll be flatting uh, both Groot and Rocket right here on the bottom left as our speed test. Now before we start, let me just show you the tools I'll be using. And for the bucket test, which I'll be doing on the left, I'll mainly just be using Clip Studio's standard bucket. Clip Studio has one of the best fill bucket tools out there. Now I won't go into details, but for a more complete look at how I use the bucket tool for flatting, make sure to check out my uh, intro to graphic novel coloring lesson on gumroad.com or skillshare.com. And there's a link in the descriptions there. First, let me uh, convert my artwork to transparency. So I'll go up here to the file menu, or edit rather, and convert brightness to opacity. That gives me a transparent background. I'll do that for both of them. And on both of them, I'll give myself a background layer and a new layer to paint on. So a new paper layer and a paint layer. And I'll do the same thing here. All right, so first I wanna make sure that my fill is set to not anti-alias. And I do that by making sure that the anti-aliasing box is checked off. And then we can have clean selections later. And also I wanna make sure that follow adjacent pixel is set to on so that it fills until it sees a boundary. I also wanna point out that I wanna turn on area scaling and set this to a value of about six. And this is six pixels. This is a great feature because as you can see, it actually grows the selection underneath the line art, reducing the potential white space between the color and the lines. The second feature I wanna point out is that you can click and drag the fill bucket without lifting your stylus. It's amazing. I literally can just sketch in these fills. This is something you can't do in Photoshop, at least as of this recording. I'll switch over to Photoshop real quick, where I have the same file open. I also want to convert my line art to transparency. I'll be using this action that I set up, and you can download this action by purchasing the Intro to Graphic Novel Coloring as well. So I'll select my line art and invoke the Convert Brightness to Transparency action. I'll make myself a new layer there, background layer, and a, uh, a layer to paint on. Let's just grab our normal fill bucket tool. And as you can see, it doesn't have as many, quite as many uh, properties as the fill bucket in Clip Studio. I'll just grab a normal color here and start filling. Of course, I wanna make sure that contiguous is on and all layers is turned on as well. But you'll notice that at the default settings, we're not quite getting our fill to creep into the line work. Now we could increase the tolerance to something like 200, and that does get a little bit closer. And in fact, if I reduce the transpar transparency of my line art, we can see that it's creeping in just enough, but it doesn't have as many flexible options for how much um, fill expansion you might be looking for like Clip Studio does. And uh, like I mentioned before, as of this recording, you can't uh, click and drag uh, you know, for multiple fills. All right, switching back to Clip Studio real quick. I'll clear that layer. Now for the manual test, I'll be mainly using a boundary and fill method. So I'll take a tool like the Turnip Pen, make sure that my anti-aliasing is turned off, lower my line out opacity, and essentially draw a boundary that I can quickly fill using the bucket tool. And in this case, I wanna make sure that my bucket tool does not have multiple referencing on, so it doesn't see the line art, and that I can quickly just fill it. So if I'm on the turnip pen, I'll be creating shapes and hitting G and just hitting the fill tool. 
very quick once you get into the muscle memory of it. All right, that's it. I'm going to flat the left side using the bucket method, then the right, and through the wonders of compositing, we'll see them both side by side and see which one is faster. Ready? Here we go. All right, we've got some epic flatting face-off music here, and uh, go ahead and keep an eye on the stopwatch in the menu bar and get a sense of uh, what the real time was. I've sped this up about 400%, so it's about a, about a four minute time lapse. But I think it gives a good sense of the difference between the two processes here. I do wanna point out on the left, as I'm using this bucket fill, I'm also constantly switching temporarily to the turnip pen just by hitting the letter P because it's just about impossible to hit all those tiny little nooks and crannies with the, with the bucket. So I'm inevitably hitting those big areas and then switching to the pen tool and filling in and doing more, fill, more filling with the bucket and switching to the pen tool and filling in. So it is a combination of both. So we're pretty neck and neck at this point in terms of uh, getting Groot filled in there. And the only extra time that's taken is now filling in these big shadow areas which are clearly missing on the left. But it's a little more true to what you want that flat to be on the right. I like this method of outlining with a non-anti-aliased pen versus lasso. I just feel like I can see clearly what's happening and I don't have to worry about what's been selected or if I've accidentally deselected something or, or removing a selection or adding a selection with the shift tool. Just makes it real easy. Right on the left, I'm already separating out elements of his clothes and his, uh, his gear. Just about done siloing the right hand side there. All right. Checking uh, the original artwork on the left. So on the right, uh, I've made sure I've locked the transparency of the layer so that I can uh, I can just paint those boundaries. Okay, well that was fun. Uh, let's take a look at the results. So on the surface, they both appear to be good quality flats, uh, usable, but let's go ahead and turn off the line art on both and see what we have underneath the hood. Well, what's immediately apparent is, is the overall quality of, of the flats. I think you'd probably agree. Um, the manual method is always gonna be much cleaner, uh, whereas the bucket method is clearly missing a lot of um, fills, especially in the dark areas. And um, like I mentioned while we were doing the flatting demo, I was I ended up using the um, turnip pen a lot anyway while I was doing gradients just to hit all those tiny little nooks and crannies that were just impossible hit to hit with just a fill bucket, at least for this style of artwork. But yeah, we have really messy silhouettes. Um, once again, the dark areas did not get filled. And um, that doesn't allow uh, a lot of opportunities to create another uh, version of our flats layer that's that's just character silhouettes. Um, in case the colorist needs to select the whole character and add an adjustment layer, add some lighting across you know all the different individual elements, um, it's just a lot more difficult to provide enough matte shapes 
for a real professional level production. Whereas on this side, uh, we have clean shapes, we still have our individual elements in there, and even more importantly, we have entire character silhouettes available to us. Now you may notice that I chose very similar colors within each character. I do this because I have set up two separate uh, magic wand tools, one for uh, selecting the entire character and one for selecting the element. And the reason I like this uh, method is because if I set my character magic wand to a color margin of about 32, and I've chosen colors within a character that are about within this little triangle of the color wheel, similar enough to recognize each other, as long as I don't change the hue. So again, I have one hue per character, and then within that character, I'll just randomly select colors about it, like in this uh, you know quadrant of the color wheel. Well, if I use my character level magic wand, I can select the entire character, even though it's made up of different colors, because that color margin is set high enough. Whereas if I use my uh, element magic wand, I can go ahead and just select those individual element shapes very easily. So that saves me from having to do a duplicate flatting layer just for the character silhouettes and another one you know, for all the disparate elements. It's just one way of doing it, and it's one um, method I've been enjoying using more recently. And it just, um, I think it, it makes my flatting layer a lot more readable because all the characters have you know, a major color. You can do the same thing in Photoshop. I've opened up our file here as well. So let me grab my magic wand. And um, just make sure that if you want a character level selection, if you like this method, again, at 32, it's only gonna select that color. But if I bump it up to something like 100, it will go ahead and select the entire character because that tolerance is lower. The, um, the lightness values are close enough and the hue is basically the same value that it'll select everything. So if I open my tool presets, I can set a new preset for magic wand. We'll just call this flatting select character. And then uh, we'll reduce this to a tolerance of zero. So that definitely will only select that one color and maybe uh, turn off contiguous so that we get all pieces of that color within a character. Makes it really easy. And we'll make a new one and we'll call this flatting select element. So now we have the same functionality, entire characters, and we can even select shift select both characters or flatting element where it just selects all the elements within that character of that single color. Now, one last thing I wanna mention is that there is a place for the bucket tool method in both Clip Studio and in Photoshop. If your line art is much simpler, if you're not dealing with gradient, uh, cross hatching, or these kind of big black dark areas in the line art, also, if you're working on an animation, obviously your uh, frame to frame animation line art is gonna be much simp simpler than this, then the bucket tool is really a blessing because you're just moving forward a frame and filling and filling and filling and filling. Really easy to move forward with that type of cell shading. But I just wanted to show you the worst case scenario where we have a very complex line art, lots of cross hatching, lots of gradients, potential unopen or, or gappy line work. Um, and yeah, in my experience, this manual method of flatting is the most consistent and produces the best professional quality flats. Well, if you have other ideas or if you want to debunk my theories, I'd love to hear it in the comments below. Who knows, I may have to make another video to update my position on flatting. But in the meantime, just enjoy the work, enjoy the process, throw some music on, and uh, have a good time flatting. We'll see you on the next round.